Water in the wine. Jesus works his first public miracle. Miracle is a word heard frequently today. People escaped unharmed from horrible car wrecks, and they refer to it as a miracle. Many spiritual broadcasts today seem to be centered around the idea of encouraging the audience to expect a miracle. Usually it is in reference to them suddenly obtaining a large amount of money. As we will see in this message, however, the word used in the Gospels often has a quite different meaning from these modern understandings. Furthermore, the miracles that Jesus performed during his earthly ministry had one focus, to prove that he was indeed the Son of God and that he is with the Father. Since the truth of the Christian faith rest on the reality of his claims about himself, we should study these miracles carefully to discover what they really prove. In our scripture passage, we will read of a wedding in Cana. However, at a first century wedding, they just did not see the happy pair stand together and promise to love, cherish, and protect each other until death do us part. The rough equivalent of such promises occurred at the betrothal when a man and a woman became engaged. The wedding was more similar to what we call a wedding reception, simply a happy celebration and a time to rejoice with the happy couple and wish them well in their new life together. Take note that there is no suggestion of drunkenness in this text. The wine used in such celebrations was usually so diluted with water that its alcohol content was only strong enough to kill any serious germs in the water. In a day with no internet, no television, not even a record player, the entire village of possibly a few hundred people would show up for the celebrating and consume lots of watered down wine. Our text for this message is John chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 and begins by setting the stage for a crisis that must have made the host feel terrible. We have no hint of how long the wedding feast had been going on before the no wine crisis occurred. Quite possibly it had been going on for hours. John chapter 2 verse 1. On the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. The chapter before this had its setting by the Jordan River where John the Baptist was preaching. John announced that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Several of John's disciples then accompanied Jesus when he left the Jordan to return to home and he may have led them to his childhood home in Nazareth just something to do. The third day in our text should be counted from the day Jesus left the Jordan River. This group of disciples probably included Peter and Andrew, John and Philip, and Nathaniel. Many people are of the idea that John's brother James was present as well at this point, thus making a total of six disciples who went to Galilee with Jesus for this wedding celebration. Cana was a small town near Nazareth, although its precise location is uncertain. Probably Jesus' mother was a relative or close friend of the bridegroom's family. She may as well have had something to do with the details of the gathering and even the amount of wine that was provided. Quote, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Unquote. Jesus was away from his home for nearly two months. During that time, he had been baptized by John the Baptist. He had spent 40 days in a desert without human companionship, was tempted by the devil, and he had returned to the Jordan and recruited his first disciples from among the disciples of John. Now he came home to Galilee just in time for the wedding in Cana, and a quick invitation was given to him and his six new disciples. Perhaps Jesus chose to begin his ministry of miracles at a wedding feast 
in order to show us that piety should not keep us from celebrating and just having a good time in life. The so-called wine had nothing to do with having a good time, but rather it was most of a small town, maybe all of the small town, celebrating the wedding. Quote, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Unquote. The host then had a very serious problem. The wine provided for the party was all gone, and a celebration was not nearly at an end. The reason for the lack of sufficient wine is unknown to us and is obviously not important. But the lack itself was terribly embarrassing to the couple getting married. Why did Jesus' mother take this terrible news to him when Jesus had done no miracles to this point? Good question. Mary probably would not have been expecting that he would perform a miracle. On the other hand, Mary knew that her son was also God's son, destined to rule forever. Now, he was approximately 30 years old. He had been baptized. He had gathered a few disciples. All of these things might have been taken to indicate that Jesus was about to assert himself and begin his promise role. Was Mary hoping he would do so by working a miracle in order to produce more wine? There's a lot open to conjecture here, but no way to prove any points. So we move on. John 2, 4 and 5. Woman, why do you invite me? Excuse me. Why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. In the Greek text, Jesus addresses Mary as simply woman. That could certainly sound as though Jesus was being rude to his mother, but Mary would not have taken it that way. It is the same way Jesus spoke to Mary as he tenderly provided for her care while he was dying on the cross in John 19:26. Still, a son addressing his mother in this way is not found in any Greek or Hebrew literature outside the Gospel of John. We wonder then about the significance of his address to his mother. Some have, some have suggested that Jesus was asserting his independence from family ties, indicating that Mary's role as his mother was now to be considered less significant than her position as his disciple. What is it to me and to you is a literal translation of why do you involve me? The words seem to say that the shortage of wine was none of his business or even of Mary's. He does provide a reason, my time has not yet come. It is clear from later usage of this language in John that his time described his crucifixion. Mary was clearly mistaken if she thought this was a time for Jesus to fulfill his mission as the Son of God. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Mary did not beg or plead with her son. She simply told the servants present to do whatever Jesus told them to do. She did not try to tell Jesus what to do, but it is clear that she hoped he would do something. Now this is the end of part one of this recounting of the life of Jesus and his first public miracle. Amen. Now, since you are here watching and listening to an explanation of Scripture, then I have to think that you also have at least some interest in how to be saved. So I'll give you a brief summary on that. How to be saved from what? How to be saved from spending eternity in hell once your physical body dies. You see, God is a very tough God. He only wants special people with him. Once the body dies, our souls continue to live with either him or Satan. We don't think about this next point much, if ever, but it's not like we have souls, but rather our souls have a body. So the soul lives forever, even when the body dies. We are eternal souls first. We commit sins, and that keeps us out of heaven, and we spend the rest of time in a place called hell. However, for a few of us, 
When we die, we then spend the rest of time with Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't know Jesus, then that can be a scary thought in itself. If you meet Jesus now, however, then spending the rest of time with him is suddenly an exciting thought. So how do you avoid hell and spend the rest of eternity with Jesus, with God? Here's how. First, it can become very complicated and convoluted if you first listen to some of the local pastors in your neighborhood or Calvinists or Arminians as they try to force their beliefs on you. In the spirit of fairness, there are dozens of scripture references that really back up all their beliefs, but unless you are working toward a degree in Bible college, I suggest that you follow the three-point simple plan of understanding and being saved. Number one, Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. People are either mostly controlled by God or by Satan, and accordingly as they are saved or unsaved. You are indwelled and somewhat controlled by either God or Satan. Number two. At one point, Jesus is quoted as saying in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus saves. Can't get more basic than that. Read 1 John 5. Jesus is the way. Now, how does this happen? Again, Jesus saves, and it is not always in church on a Sunday morning. Really? Really. Start with the Apostle Paul. Number three, Paul was saved on the road to Damascus as Jesus suddenly appeared to him out of nowhere and saved him right there on the spot. Paul did not have to walk the aisle in church Sunday in order to be saved. Jesus simply saved him without even being asked. Jesus can do that. Really, Jesus saves whom he wishes. Acts chapter 9 for details. So in the interest of keeping it simple for all of us, we have this summary involving salvation and repentance. If you are feeling called by God to make it into heaven someday, then pray to him sincerely apologizing with a spirit of repentance, that is, with the intention of living a more God-honoring life from then on, and he will save you in that instant right on the spot. He was calling you, and you responded in a positive way. Now afterward comes the work of repentance. He indwells you then, and will make you morally stronger, and lead you to a better, more pleasing life. That's the work of repentance. It comes after you are saved. If you don't see a change in your life, ask God about that fact. All you have to do to ensure your salvation is to be sincere when you ask. He'll take care of the rest. The key sin you might be guilty of is not believing in Jesus as the Son of God. Trust him for your salvation. Afterward, Jesus told us to be baptized. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Now that's why you go to church, not to be saved, but rather to be baptized and learn about Jesus Christ and his commands to us. It is simply a matter of obedience that we are to be baptized after we are saved. Keep in mind that one of the lesser known truths is that once you are saved, you become a priest of God. No, you don't have to start dressing funny, but you do have to start living with a lot less sin in your life praying for people and telling people about being saved by Jesus. Next is to find a home church. It's a very tough decision to find your home church. You want a church where you find leaders, 
teaching others what to do for them to be saved, and then what you do afterwards as a Christian. Many churches don't do this and or they teach other than salvation by faith or teach faith plus works. If they're into work, money, 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 how you can get more money, or their fun, fun, fun with their church band and speaking in tongues, then run out of the door to that building and look elsewhere. Don't even stay for the end of the service. It's too dangerous because they are totally misleading. A few a church no-nos, Roman Catholic, Methodist, Mormons, run and hide first. Check carefully any church before visiting it. If nothing else, you want to make sure that they teach faith in Jesus plus nothing to be saved. If they have sacraments of any kind, then keep away from them. All right? All right. Praise the Lord.